Without further ado, here's Dr. Shadi. Let's give him another welcome up to the stage. <laughs> like Turn the that. mic on whenever you're ready. Hello, hello, hello. I don't think it's on yet. Hello, all right. Okay, thanks everybody. You know my background now, cool. All right, so we're gonna talk about human abdomen and it basically turns into a splenectomy talk. I think that's the most common thing that we're gonna deal with. So let's just start off with some basic anatomy, spleen, it can be variable size, variable colors, um, even variable positioning depending on its size and what disease process you're talking about. We are also gonna focus the discussion on the dogs, although we do recognize that cats do get diseases as well as the spleen and other causes of human abdomen, but dogs are of course the more common more common species we're going to deal with. The vasculature of the spleen, of course, is very important if you're going to consider removing the spleen with surgery. So you want to make sure you have a sense of the anatomy. Admittedly, of course, if you perform spleen before, uh, you know what, a, what kind of a mess could be in that abdomen between the hemorrhaging, the omentum attached to it, all the blood clots, the tumors. So sometimes the anatomy gets distorted. You have to just take every case as it is, but it is important to recognize the splenic vasculature as well. And then, microscopically speaking, this plays a huge role in splenic function. We're not going to go over the histopath. I just want to be aware of that it exists. There's a lot to it. And even, even though uh, um, it's, it's obviously well known with histologic anatomy in dogs and cats, there's still not clear consensus on how the histopath plays a role with its function. It's, it's crazy. When I was performing the literature search on this, it's just there's still not a, a consensus. Your, your proceedings, um, if you don't have them, you will. There's a lot more information there regarding this information, regarding this topic. But I just want to be aware that spinous is the path, lots of functionality, very important, and everything that we talked about today, red blood cells, platelets, immune function, the spleen is vitally important. And if you know any human beings that do not have their spleen, it's a pretty significant immune compromise state that they have for the rest of their life without a spleen. We don't see that in animals um, to that degree, but realize how important splenic function is for the immune system, not just for blood cells and platelets, it's, it's massive for the immune system as well. So incidence of splenic lesions. Um, now, uh, a caveat to all of this stuff. So when you look at the literature, you try to figure out percentages. Uh, we all like to quote the, the, the incidences of these diseases, especially something as, as uh, drastic as hemangiosarcoma, the spleen. The numbers do get a bit confusing and they're all over the place. Any, any given study, it all depends on what kind of angle they're going for, are they trying to find out, retrospective, prospective, et cetera. So, so these percentages, you may look at and be like, well, that's weird, or that's a really broad range. Yeah, because the literature is hard to interpret when it comes to this disease. It's so common and so devastating, and every study is so different in how they're organizing it, so be aware of that. Your proceedings have this information in there as well, but just take this information and sort of go with it in more general format, it's really hard to summarize all the literature because of those, of those issues. So splenic lesions make up 0.3 to 2% of all neoplasm diseases in dogs that are over the, uh, year of, uh, over the age of eight years of age. 5% of all non-skin primary malignant neoplasms in large breeds are from the spleen. That's, that's a pretty high, high percentage. And the spleen incidence of neoplastic, not hemangiosar, but all the neoplastic diseases are somewhere around maybe 50 to 60 percent incidence. Unclassified diagnosis, 0.4 percent. Not neoplastic, 30 to 50 percent. Overall malignancy, 76 percent. Again, it, it, it's, these numbers are all over the place. They're variable. I try my best to summarize them from the literature. And then benign incidence, uh, under 30 percent. The point here is that malignancies of the spleen are far more common than benign. We know that. When I think in people, it's the exact opposite. Someone can correct me if they know better, but I think in people, the benign conditions are way more common than, than the malignancies. Unfortunately for dogs, we don't, we don't see that. So when you look at splenic neoplasia uh, specifically, so this is not all splenic masses, benign and neoplastic, this is just neoplastic. Overall incidence, 33 to 66%. Malignancy, very high. Um, of the malignancies, the majority are hemangiosarcoma. sarcoma. I believe that range, that's crazy. Most folks will quote somewhere around the 80 to 90% incidence with hemangiosarcoma, sarcoma, but just realize there's a wide range depending on the study. Overall, hemangiosarcoma sarcoma is found in a good majority of dogs affected with splenic uh, neoplastic disease. 
Splenic can't, uh, hemangiosarcoma is responsible for hemoabdomen in 76% of cases. And splenic hematoma with the hemoabdomen, the remainder, about 30%. With hemangiosarcoma, in three quarters of these cases, the hemangiosarcoma lesion is a source of hemorrhage in those cases. This slide is just a reminder that there are many other cancers that exist of the spleen. It's not just hemangiosarcoma. We focus on it, but it's so common and it's so devastating. But there is a long list of, of tumors. And I, I would say probably in my own experience, um, the osteosarc and the um, uh, other sarcomas are, 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 are probably the next most common ones, although not common at all, but there's a, there's a long list. And also that these things come in all different, different uh, presentations, right? You can have that very large isolated splenic mass. You can have just sort of general splenomegaly, or maybe the, the, the nodules are not as palpable, but you, when, you, when you cover the spleen, splenic surface, you can feel them uh, within the body of the spleen. And then ultrasound images like this are, are all too common. But be aware that without this path, you don't really know what this is. The point of having statistics like this is they have an idea so you can have a conversation with the client prior to them diving into something a, a, a bit more, uh, not only uh, uh, financially expensive, but emotionally expensive as well. So hemangiosarcoma will be our focus for this talk. It's more, most common. So it's malignancy of vascular endothelial origin. It results in widespread metastatic disease and of course survival in dogs. There are lots of reported primary sites of hemangiosarcoma. The spleen, of course, is number one. And when you look at metastatic hemangiosarcoma, the liver is the most common site. We all are aware of this. Then the omentum is second, mesentery is third. But there's lots of areas of metastatic. I, I biopsy them in vertebral bodies uh, compressing the spinal cord. It, you, can, you can see it in a variety of places. I've had it suspected on brain MRIs as well for metastatic disease. So yeah. needless to say, obviously, when you have a cancer of the vasculature, it tends to spread via the vasculature, right? so it can go anywhere. I won't go into all the critical care stuff, obviously. We've had plenty of, of talks on that. So just keep in mind a, a primary issue with cases that show up with rough or splenic mass, whether it's mangio or not, doesn't matter, it's rough or splenic mass and hemoabdomen, you're seeing all the secondary effects from, from those cases. Um, the quite a lot of the aspects of this have been brought up many times. You know, keep in mind you can find coagulopathic changes in lots of dogs that have a variety of diseases. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be cancer. In general, any inflammatory process can alter their coagulation profiles. So just keep that in mind in general. And as you've seen today, you know, not, not every thrombocytopenia is equal, right? You can have thrombocytopenia, but it's not below that 20, 30,000 mark, maybe it's something to be concerned about. So you have to take that information that you find and, uh, and compare it to the remainder of the case. So you can also characterize uh, neoplastic disease in general, not just splenic masses based on stages. And the reason why this is important is because this plays a role in prognosis with these dogs. So we'll go over prognosis obviously towards the end, but just keeping in mind the difference between stage one, two, and three. Stage one, localized disease, so this is the splenic tumor. Stage two, you've got the splenic tumor and um, uh, possible lymph node involvement, or the splenic tumor and its rupture. And then stage three, you've got metastatic disease. So these, these do play a role in prognosis, and that's why it's important, and it all comes down to client communication. You can, you can change the category of the patient uh, based on their stage. And then, of course, that's useful for the, for the pedal to know. So not to rehash things that everybody here is familiar with, but uh, it's always useful. So you're looking for these types of diseases in the older dog. Um, gold retrievers are number one. We've got the shepherds and other large breed dogs that can be affected by, by the disease. Keeping in mind, of course, any breed can be affected, but we mostly see it in the, the gold retrievers. The German shepherd are probably the most common. I have, I have um, um, found this disease in smaller breed dogs as well. In fact, I, I think, anecdotally speaking, when I perform splenectomies for a splenic mass with about my abdomen in small breed dogs, I mean, I can't remember the last one that wasn't that wasn't hemangiosarcoma in small breeds. Whereas larger dogs, there's maybe a chance, might be benign. Um, so I don't know if that's if that's anyone else's experience here with that. But anecdotally, I tend to get much more worried about uh, splenic hemangiosarcoma in the small breed dogs. Clinical signs, gel gums, weakness, collapse. You know, these are typically uh, acute onset, um, although I have seen cases where yeah, I suspect there's probably a chronic bleed. So you have the, if you really probe the owner's history, they'll say something like, oh yeah, I did notice like a month ago, I had a day where it was kind of lethargic, and then bounce back. 
then like two weeks ago, a bit quiet, refused using the stairs, didn't really want to eat, and then bounced back. And then now I'm seeing them for, for a splenic mass and hemoabdomen. And so I thought, boy, you know, I wonder if those were bleeds that occurred, the patient was affected, body stopped the bleed, and then they bounced back. And, you know, I, I, obviously I can't prove that. Um, sometimes when I'm in surgery, though, for those patients with that kind of history, and I see that there's a bunch of momentum attached to the spleen, a lot of scar tissue, then I think, okay, there's clearly chronic bleeding here. It kind of fits what the history is. So we went over in our case examples what some of the diagnostics are. You know, obviously, you're looking for anemia, thrombocytopenia. You may have a, a leukocytosis, probably a stress leukogram, but of course, you need to take the whole clinical picture into, into uh, effect. Um, the anemia um, can vary in severity and regenerative versus non regenerative depending on the case. And it kind of also depends on you know, how many parameters you're using to define regenerative anemia as well. But most of us are going with particular site counts, obviously, on our in house CBCs. Radiographs, like we spoke about in the prior, in the prior talk about basic abdominal surgery approaches, um, you're trying to find any other disease that may be related to the splenic mass slash hemoabdomen that's occurring. Most of us are using. Uh, three view thoracic radiographs look for metastatic disease. Keeping in mind, of course, micrometastasis will not be picked up by radiographs. Even CAT scan, although it's, it's going to be far more accurate, a higher yield, may miss micrometastasis micro in these dogs. So keep that in mind, too. You have to warn the owner that although we don't see over metastatic disease, uh, it's highly suspected if this is an sarcoma that it's probably already happened. Um, then you have the uh, radiograph here of of a, a large globoid heart, and so as we've already mentioned multiple times, you want to try and screen them if you can for pericardial effusion, maybe even a cardiac mass, depending on your skills with ultrasound. But that's something the owner is going to want to know about. Obviously, it doesn't just affect their decision making, but it affects anesthetic parameters too. And then, of course, radiographs. Um, so sometimes you you'll have an abdominal radiograph again at least two views, ideally three, but at least two views, and you'll see that, oh wow, that looks like maybe it's a splenic mass, could be a liver mass, uh, anything in the, in the cranial ventral abdominal quadrant, you know, that's, that lives there could have a mass, but again, uh, at least it tells you, okay, there's clearly something growing there, so it warrants discussion, warrants further investigation, and then of course, ultrasound can, ooh, sorry, ultrasound can look like a, a variety of, of conditions, you know, depending on what the, what the spleen is doing. If you if you see models like this, or you could, you could find uh, just a very, very large mass. Um, the point of this also is to remind you that you can characterize splenic diseases in terms of either a, a, a localized splenic disease, so a mass, or generalized splenic disease, so just splenic megaly, or multifocal to diffuse splenic disease, so there's multiple nodules in the spleen, right? Just, just a different, different way of thinking about it. You also define splenic mass in terms of uh, hemic versus non-hemic conditions. It's academic, uh, it's just, just so you can sort of keep an organized mindset, but I just wanted to show there are different presentations of these, of these diseases on ultrasound. So that is gonna be the main, the main way that we're kind of going to try to look for the source of the hemoabdomen. Um, is there any liver involvement? Is there lymph node involvement? Other organs, other organs involved? What other comorbidities are there? Now, admittedly, for other diagnostics, you know, a lot of us aren't going to go beyond probably radiographs, if not ideally ultrasound, and then from there you're talking with the client about what the options are. Um, I don't aspirate the spleen myself. Yeah, I don't know the, the criticalness. You guys, yeah, I mean, maybe if there's an internist involved, they may aspirate the spleen. It's just, it's just a high uh, rate of, uh, you know, it's a poor yield, really. You know, you end up getting you know, peripheral blood or extra medullary metaphysics or something. It's just that like you can't work with it. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, and especially if you have a hemoabdomen, uh, you know, is it going to change what you do? So, but I'm just, I'm being thorough. So there it is. Uh, CAT scan MRI, really the end of the day, uh, depending on everything else, it's an exploratory laparotomy, and then histopath confirms. You want to be careful with opening up the abdomen and saying, oh, this is ugly, let's call the owner, let's euthanize on the table. It depends. It depends on the owner, it depends on how you set things up with them, it depends on what you're seeing. You need histopath to confirm the diagnosis. We know the stats. So, the, and, and so you've already educated the client on the stats. They've already gone this far knowing the stats. So be careful with euthanizing on the table or recommending it. Obviously, you won't use your own judgment. You need to be ethical and communicate with the client clearly. But just remember, you need his path to confirm the diagnosis. And I've had cases of manual sarcoma that are out a year post-op, you know, with no chemo. And my thinking is, boy, was that his path wrong then? Or just a really lucky dog that got away with, with you know, having a malignancy like this? 
So it can go either way with these cases, but just be careful of, with, uh, with overestimating uh, what you're seeing in the OR. Again, you have to use your, use your judgment. So this is just some, just some advanced imaging. This is a CT scan um, of, a, of a splenic mass here. Again, this is not your conventional way of diagnosing these, but sometimes your other imaging modalities aren't, aren't uh, giving you all the answers, or maybe you found a splenic mass, it, there's no hemoglobin, the dog is stable, maybe, maybe this is aclinical, you don't know. And the pet, the, the client wants a full body uh, imaging to look for metastatic disease on CAT scan, assess the abdominal cavity further, you know, it just depends, it's up to the client, and you know, again, how you feel is, is, is absolutely appropriate, but you know, in this, in this case here, we're trying to depict, there, there's a nodule in the lungs, maybe that didn't get picked up on thoracic radiograph before the CAT scan, whatever the reason is, but just keep in mind that, you know, the, every, not every splenic mass you find is an immediate surgery, right? The patient, if you find this incidentally, and there's no clinical signs, um, you can offer clients diagnostic workups to get more thorough explanation of what's going on with their pet. So it's just, just that's, the, that's the whole point of this. Obviously, this is not a routine thing. This is not conventional. Just saying that, think of these options. Or let's say, for example, I do have a pet that uh, has a splenic mass, no clinical signs, doesn't need immediate surgery, but the client's willing to, and then the preoperative, the, the metastatic screening on the radiographs shows something questionable, and I can't tell what that questionable thing is. The radiologist's interpretation isn't really helping me. Nothing wrong with the thoracic CT to, to characterize it further. You'll get a lot of information that way. If you have time on your side, the client is willing to do these things. Stabilization, I'm not going to touch further. We've done all the things. So you're stabilizing because you can to get into surgery, and that's the point of that. So uh, this is just to go over different splenic surgeries. That's it. You know, in, in dogs, because splenic malignancies are so common, especially if you have sarcoma, uh, you would never perform a partial splenectomy on a dog with a splenic mass. Never. Never. It's always going to be a complete splenectomy. If you're going in there to remove a mass, you're removing the entire spleen. Different in people. In people, the immune function of the spleen is vital, and benign disease is much more common. In dogs, the entire spleen is going. I've seen one partial splenectomy for a dog that had a, a, a splenic infarction because it became entrapped in like an inguinal hernia, hernia, something weird, you know? Fine. Um, even in that case, I biopsy the spleen that's removed anyway, and one of the clients, this comes back as a manusark for some weird reason. We're gonna go back and remove the rest of the spleen, right? Because that's how common hemangiosarcoma sarcoma is, or, mal or malignancy is, especially hemangiosarcoma. sarcoma. You're not going to perform a partial splenectomy in a dog that has an isolated splenic tumor. The entire spleen is gone. Complete splenectomy. Um, so this is just for, I'm just placing this here to be thorough, because these are your three splenic surgeries that you have options for performing. Um, the splenography is, I've, I don't think I've ever done one of these, but that's basically how like a splenic laceration and you're, you're repairing it. That's, you know, and, and probably imagine most folks they do this, they're doing this because they accidentally cut the spleen going through the linea alba to do whatever else with the abdomen, right? So that's probably when you're gonna be doing this. Um, but otherwise, if you're going there for a splenic mass, it's gonna be a complete splenectomy. I imagine partials are very, very, very rare. Every splenectomy is getting a liver biopsy. The liver looks normal, biopsy something. I'm sure there are different opinions. Justin asked, do you biopsy every, every liver uh, with, with splenectomies? I do. There, there was a paper that came out that said that like, if it doesn't look red or black, it's probably in its normal liver, it's probably not metastatic. But I have biopsy normal liver and got metastatic disease, so I just it takes three seconds. I, I just I biopsy every liver. Yeah, yeah there's, there's minimal to no complication to the patient. It adds, it, it adds an insignificant amount of time to anesthesia duration to just biopsy the liver, and you get that peace of mind. Obviously, if you see a lesion or lesions on the liver, then you want to biopsy that or those um, if it's safe for you to access that portion of the liver. Otherwise, if the liver looks, liver looks normal grossly and you have no evidence of liver disease prior, let's say, although a shocking patient can have elevated liver values, sure, um, I, I'm going to biopsy uh, the, the liver. It, it just, it just, it, I don't see any harm in doing it. But, you know, let's say, for example, um, uh, finances are tight and the client literally, there, this is the splenic that you're going to perform for the first time because the client wants you to do it and they just can't afford a liver biopsy and, and the histopath uh, evaluation. Fine. You know, save that pet's life. Forget the liver then. And it doesn't matter if it's sarcoma. You know what the stats are on that, right? And then come back to benign. Great. Surgery is probably curative. But in the ideal scenario, I'm, I'm going to biopsy the liver. Um, I'm not a big fan of performing, you know, ancillary procedures on dogs 
that have these conditions, especially if they come in like in critical condition. So I'm, I'm, you know, I tend to stray away from forming like a neuter at the same time as a splenectomy or a mass removal on the skin. Um, now, if the client is really insisting, you know, they've had, they've been dealing with this disgusting uh, mammary gland mass forever, and now the opportunity arises, we just remove it at the same time. I have a conversation with them of here are the pros and cons. I'm going to be allowed to abandon ship on the mammary gland removal if this dog is doing well under anesthesia. I'm not a fan of it. So I bring it up because. Obviously, you want to perform prophylactic gastrotexies in like your stays, and, you know, in the appropriate uh, uh, size dogs, and the client who wants to do that, it's great. But if, if, let's say it's a large breed dog, which almost always are, and you're like, oh, should we pexy at the same time? I mean, I don't know. I probably wouldn't. But there's also the risk of GDV, post splenectomy, right? It is a risk factor to developing GDV. So you can make an argument for that as well. So for me, um, I will uh, uh, offer it to the client and tell them I'm going to judge whether or not this patient can handle it, and then and then it's up to, it's up to me. Um, I'd rather perform a gastropexy later on than risk the patient dying on the table because I added 15 more minutes to perform the gastropexy. But again, uh, Justin, any opinion on that? What do you what do you typically do? Uh, I, it's a really good. I, so I I tend to like play it by ear. Like if, like they're mostly a lot of them are at risk breeds, so I usually will just do a quick like pexy. Um, if they're really like trying to die, then I'll just, I'll actually just like staple it real quick and then just get out. Um, so, but if it, you know, like you said, it's kind of like patient dependent, but there's, I think there's enough literature that's like questionable that there's two, two trains, right? Half of it says that splenectomy is a risk factor for GDV and half says it's not. So if yeah. it's a shepherd, they're getting a pexy as long as they're stable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so keep into account you know, your client communication with those, with those comorbidities. You know, if the dog happens to have bladder stones that it was never clinical for, at the same time that he's got the hemoabdomen and splenic mass, do you do a cystotomy at the same time or not, right? Have a discussion with the clients to make that, make that call, and then you're allowed to just override the call and surgery if you feel it's in the best interest of the patient, and, they understand, and the client understands that. <coughs> Uh, okay, yeah, so surgery the next step. So this is the, you know, the splenic laceration repair is placing some sutures uh, over the splenic capsule. Um, again, this is probably most often done by accidental, you know, iatrogenic laceration of the spleen. Um, and then uh, here's your partial splenectomy that nobody here is ever going to do uh, with a splenic mass ever. It's going to be complete splenectomies all day long. And then, of course, obviously the other is a complete splenectomy where you're going to remove the, uh, the entire organ. And so, you know, the variety of techniques for this. Um, I don't know what the status, what's the status now of ligatures? Are they still around? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, so I know for a time it was kind of questionable whether you can buy a ligature. So for me, um, the, uh, the ligature device is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's just a massive <laughs> cartery unit. It's amazing. And this thing, it, it's, I compare it to like Pac-Man, just goes through the vessels. It's, it, it takes just one down to a matter of minutes to remove the actual spleen. Um, what I will say with this, if, if you perform a lot of abdominal surgeries for, for cases like this, you know, splenectomies or nephrectomies, liver lobectomies, and you're looking for an investment in something, um, I, I, just, I love Ligature. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. It decreases your time so, so drastically. The only thing I will warn you of, if you're performing a splenectomy on a patient that you're still struggling with the type of bulimia and the shock and everything else with it uh, during the operation, the, the main splenic artery in your vein may seem quite collapsed. And you might be tempted to just use a ligature if you're going to do this. Ligature on the splenic artery and vein. I can promise you once that patient resuscitation is successful, you may end up blowing out that, that vessel that you cauterize with the ligature device. So I would still use a, a ligature, sorry, um, a suture to, to uh, a circumferential on that vessel, two of them, two circumferentials on that main vessel, because when that patient does go back to stability, it's going to stress your surgical site. The remainder of the splenic vessels, I'm okay just going right across the ligature like Pac-Man and removing that spleen. But the main splenic artery and vein, you're going to still want to suture it even though it looks pretty small to you. You're going to want to isolate it and, and place suture there. Um, but there's plenty of instruments that you can, you can uh, uh, use to try and perform a splenectomy. It just depends on how often you're doing these, what your comfort level is. Um, but I use ligature on, on everything. I use it on like, routine space and stuff. Like, it's, it's fantastic. But uh, the technique you want to use is up to you. I will say that if you are planning on forming splenectomies, you know, if you can get owner permission for a dog that you euthanize, um, you know, you get a cadaver and practice with whatever technique you want. Obviously, the most simple technique is going to be just suturing. 
you know, isolating each vessel and suturing them and getting getting comfortable doing that. You know, because time is of the essence when you're dealing with a hemoabdomen. You also want your personal hygiene to be not a hemoabdomen. You don't want to rush it. You want to be in there and be able to take your time with your own sleep if you're going to venture into this world and you have no experience with it. Cadavers first, work on that, and then from there the right case, and then you know, and then go from there if you're going to venture into this lengthy world of our splenic masses. And if you do a lot of procedures, then it's really nice investing in, in fancier stuff because they will speed up the process for the spleen. So you're going to go into the more one, the more uh, unstable hemoabdomens. So um, a very busy slide. Um, I'm not looking to spend too much time on this. And again, depending on the literature, what you read, there's lots of lots of uh, our ranges. So I figured, uh, you know, we'll just mention it. So. It, the stage matters in terms of managing sarcoma post-op survival time. So you can see here, obviously stage three has less survival than a stage one. That makes sense. And then if you combine, uh, uh, if you compare the combination of stage one and stage two, they, uh, you know, the one survival is six percent. Um, uh, the majority of them are only about what three months, you know, survival. So you know that that pretty much makes sense. What what we said. Benign disease tends to be almost curative. Again, depending on the study, you know, I imagine a lot of these dogs that are going out, you know, one year and beyond, they're probably dying from some other non-splenic mass-related disease, right? That's old, and, and that's what happens. So, it, 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 for, for all intents and purposes, it's benign. If I do see a hemorrhagic sarcoma in my hands that's going out this long, I question the initial histopathic results on it. Uh, but I'll take it. I'll take the win, you know. But just be be aware that histopathic is not perfect either. Still a person reading it. Um, malignancy, of course, you know, 85 day survival, you know, 20% maybe make it to one year. I don't know. I mean, again, this is malignant, so it's, so it's not hemorrhagic sarcoma specifically. This is all malignancy, so this is obviously going to be artificially inflated. But, uh, you know, that's, that sounds pretty good if it's cancer of the spleen, but yeah, when you've got hemorrhagic sarcoma, you're looking at 30% surviving two months, 7% surviving one year. So um, surgery alone uh, is, is going to be less than with chemo post op. And um, you know, client communication, we have accessible too. As far as chemo, obviously, you're probably going to refer these to an oncologist if the, if the owner wants more information, wants to pursue it. And then, and then the, the if you diagnose a splenic hematoma, of course, it's probably going to be better than than malignancy, obviously. We already spoke a lot about you know, I'm, I'm putting this under complications, but we all know based on all these talks that this can happen as they're, as they're presenting to you, obviously. But you see cardiac abnormalities and. We really went through different ways of trying to stabilize the pet, take care of those complications. So um, we've gone through a lot of this also in, in more detail with folks who are way more experienced in critical care than I ever will be. But these are all the reasons why you end up finding uh, issues with these with these splenic masses. It's obviously a, uh, the the issues with splenic uh, disease dogs are multifactorial. There's lots of different things going on at the same time, and that's before you even know the diagnosis. That's just leading up to stabilizing you going to surgery. So. Um, I don't know how much a role, you know, manipulating the spleen in surgery matters. I will tell you, just, just because we're talking about splenectomies, you know, if you've got a splenic torsion, you're not going to untors it. You're trying to remove it uh, in total, right? So remove the entire thing as is. Again, whether you'll be dabbling in splenic torsions or not, I don't know. But just again, keep in mind, you're not, you're not going to detours or untors the splenic torsion. So uh, otherwise, you're going to release all these uh, uh, oxygen radicals and cause. I mean, I've seen it happen, and then you just you see just ECG just go nuts, and uh, at that point there are the VTAC, VFib, all the things, and you know we need critical care involved in that. <laughs> so you're not going to need to worry. You're removing the entire thing, but again, it's outside the, the, the parameters of this talk. I don't know. At the point, I don't know how much um, manipulating the spleen matters. I don't know, Justin. Do you ever notice anything if you're messing with a really large mass and it's here, the everything? Do you tend to think that you get more cardiac abnormalities intra-op when you're manipulating the spleen? No, I have a weird theory that um, the the the, the splanchnic nerve on this, on the vessel. I, I don't ligate that. If I if I do ligate down there, I separate it out and don't ligate it. And I subjectively think that um, it decreases like the ventricular arrhythmias with that. But I, I have no data to back that up at all. But I haven't seen a lot since I've not or just used laser sure, or didn't incorporate that into a, or cut it. So. I would say I don't see like abrupt changes in ECG from splenic manipulation. Um, I do think that if you decide to derotate, same way if you derotate, you know, your GVD or mesenteric torsion, 
profound hypotension from all of those um, inflammatory mediators and free radicals. I don't necessarily think that there's a uh, direct correlation between your manipulation and ventricular arrhythmias. Potential changes in uh, radiate arrhythmias or tachycardia, but not necessarily ventricular. Yeah, and this goes back to the idea of, you know, do you want to dabble in splenectomies? You'd like to have these monitoring parameters available to you during the surgery. You need to have a continuous ECG. Ideally, you want to have constant blood pressure monitoring. Ideally, you want to have the ability to be able to run a PCV immediately in troughs and then goes wrong. So you want these things available to you. Again, with, with your own experience, what you have available to you, and especially client, clear client communication, you can decide whether or not you're going to tackle any of this stuff. I see on the clock here, we're running out of time. I'm going to stop now. How much longer do you have? Oh. Let's see. What are we here? Why don't you finish off? Sure. So predictive factors. So when you look at a literature and it's trying to figure out, you know, what, what can you do to maximize your prediction that this is actually cancer or not before you perform surgery? And I'm not sure I'd ever go solely based on these factors. And again, it depends on the study. Um, but these sort of you know, biomarkers or, or uh, 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 predictive factors maybe will help you in discussing with the client what the possibilities are. So we tend to see more malignancy if they've got low protein or low, low platelets. We tend to see higher risk of having uh, splenic cancer, especially mangiosarcoma, if you're seeing you know, schistocytes, for example, these fragmented red blood cells, or if they have a hemoabdomen. We see more hemoabdomen with splenic malignancy than we do benign disease, right? So these are just other factors to talk about when you talk to the client. You know, they're trying to figure out if they want to put their 14 year old German Shepherd through a splenectomy and all the critical care stuff or not. If you have these parameters on hand, it may help you sort of gear the conversation. You don't know for sure, these don't replace histopath, but it, it at least helps suggest things. We see that um, uh, when you look at the size of the mass in comparison to the spleen and the patient as a whole, the, the, um, the higher mass to splenic volume ratio versus manusarcoma, the benign. Uh, 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 dogs, benign cases, have a higher mass to splenic volume ratio than humanity sarcoma does. So that's pretty interesting, interesting to know. So it may help you with the, again, with the client conversation. That's the idea here. Again, these are all before you're cutting, as you're trying to figure out does this client want to do this or not. If you have an ultrasound that has the measure of the splenic, splenic mass and the splenic itself, you can maybe do some, some math and, and try to gear them in, in the right direction. When you're looking at prognostic factors, this is what, what relates to how the survivability of the patient with a splenic mass. Um, interesting enough, the older patients, it's an increased survival. Although again, most of these patients are older anyway, so I don't know how much that really plays a role. If you have um, the severity of the anemia also plays a role in mortality. And this also is self-evident, right? I mean, you, if, you didn't, if you didn't know that tonight, you said, hey, do you think how bad the anemia is dictates how what likelihood they're going to survive? Yeah, we all kind of think that, you know? It's much better off if they're mildly anemic versus severely anemic. They require less stuff to take care of and stabilize them for surgery. So it's kind of common sense, but we see it in the literature. The number of gross lesions in the spleen, um, they have more than one. 0% of dogs are alive by one year post op, versus if they have one lesion, 16% are alive by one year post op. And these are significant findings. So that plays a role as well. We already discussed stage one dogs do better than the more advanced stages. It's um, the DIC, and I don't know if the criticalists have an opinion on this. You tend to see clinically that a neutrophilia and bombocytopenia are more associated with DIC or not really? I, I not yeah. noticed that. I, I truly can never tell which of my patients are going to crack out. Yeah. And that is why I was saying earlier I prep them before surgery. One of three things is going to happen everything goes great, it's benign. Everything goes well, you have trouble in the hospital, but you get you home, or you don't leave. Yeah, yeah, so he's saying so for clear client communication, warn them about all the things that are possible with a splenic mass, that this can go either, either way. And of course, if they have you know, respiratory signs associated with disease, there's going to be a higher risk of death. That's, that's obvious. Bicapturary fusion, yep, not a good thing to have, obviously. Um, uh, if they end up needing a blood transfusion, Higher chance of death, sure, you know, why not? High lactate, yeah, these are all things we see commonly with, with these diseases, regardless of hemoglobin or GDVs or whatever else. Um, uh, VPCs, splenic torsion, uh, those are also negative prognostic factors. If the source of the bleeding in the spleen, apparently that's a protective value that actually help them help the patient out more. So these are just things to consider when you're trying to assess postoperatively, intraoperatively, what the, where to put this patient.
prognosis. So finally, key points uh, that I'd like for you to leave away with is splenic mass literature, it's, it's hard to interpret. The numbers are going to be broad and all over the place, so just keep that in mind. You just want to have a general sense so you can have a clear um, understanding of it for yourself and for the client. Client communication is key with all these steps along this whole process. Splenic histopath is vital to confirming the diagnosis. I would recommend hepatic biopsy, but it depends. Um, whether or not you perform concurrent surgical procedures, like the cystotomy example or whatever, depends. You gotta talk to the client and, and, and have, have them decide what they wanna do, and then of course you can, can uh, overtake their decision or not. And then post-operative care is essential to success in these cases where maybe your facility doesn't have like, adequate post-operative care to tackle these cases, and a 24-7 uh, um, ER, especially hospitals, more, more, more uh, uh, preferable to, to that. And if you have any, any questions, I'll take them any time. Wonderful. Thanks, Dr. Shah. We're going to.